This morning's gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask me this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate answered him, So you are, ki you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit. That may we, as we receive of your spirit and consume your word, be changed anew for your glory. And gracious Lord, as now as I humbly proclaim your message, I pray that you are in fact glorified in spite of my weaknesses. As we pray all this now in Jesus' name, amen. So we come to the end of our liturgical calendar year. We have been, we are, we are united through the um, lectionary, which is a three-year cycle that um, unites uh, churches um, all around the world on the similar um, passages. Doesn't mean that we have to, or pastors has to preach from um, the lectionary, which gives suggestions of, of different um, gospel lessons or, or um, Old Testament readings and Psalms. But, it, but if we design our prayers around this, the spirit of the lectionary and our message, it's another way to be reminded that we are a church universal. Right? You, you, sometimes we, in the Apostles' Creed, we'll have the, the word Catholic Church, lowercase c, which means the one church of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so we are finishing up in lectionary B, and we'll soon be entering into the lectionary season of C, um, and that starts the first day of Advent, which is next week. So this is our little <coughs> celebration. So the first thing I want to do is, I, I often do this, is I invite you to have um, your New Year resolutions drafted in the now. And then at New Year's, I remind you of them. That's what we're gonna do this year. Start thinking about what New Year resolutions you wish to take on within the spirit of being in closer fellowship with Christ the King, Christ our Savior. I wanted to um, recap um, the spirit of which the underlying message of this year's message was. And it was this slide that I showed often in uh, mostly February, March which was big things happen in small groups. Big things happen in small groups. Those of us here, um, as we come together in small groups, we've seen what big things can happen, right? Big things can happen in small churches. Um, the idea of this was, the, the underlying message was, we were watching Jesus meet people where they were. Right? We've seen times in the Bible where there's large gatherings, right? We, we know that Jesus fed the multitudes. We know that Jesus felt so bombarded by people that he would have to go off in a boat and find a place to pray alone. We've seen times when, when people were ripping off, uh, sh uh, for modern day language, uh, shingles on the roof to lower people in because they couldn't get to Jesus with so many people around him. And, and this, this last year's focus was more of those intimate times with Jesus. We've seen that we have people calling out and um, asking Jesus to heal them. We're asking that we see people meeting Jesus um, with concerns of where they're going to be in eternity. We've seen people making mistakes and, and wanting to be at Jesus' right hand and left hand, you know, like second in command. But it's all showing us that although we are not perfect, Jesus is willing to meet with us in our small group gatherings. One of the small group gatherings that first comes to my mind here at the church is, is our Bible study, where we come together and it's been, um, we may be going on to a new curriculum um, in a couple of months. Right now we're staying in Genesis. 
But it's a time where we kind of get off the rails a little bit and we share questions, which is great because that tells me that we're trusting within our small group, where we're not afraid to get the right answer, but rather we're willing to explore the question. The next small group that's coming to mind is our uh, GCC, um, Grace Craft Connection, where um, we've seen the connections come to, in that. We've seen ministry uh, in our community, and we have seen trusted relationships come out of this group. So this year, we're going to be, I'm going to share at the end of this message how we're going to extend. Every year, I like to have an underlying theme of where we're, of, of our mission. And this, this works our way not only here in the sanctuary on Sunday, but also in our, in our gatherings and our leadership roles. I'll be sharing that at the end of this message. <clears throat> to recap this year's mission of... Um, and, well, two years ago, we, I did a, a year-long uh, series on mission and trying to remind the congregation and myself that mission is not the same thing as charity, where mission is where we meet people. Charity is where we give something to someone. Mission is where we meet each other. It's a give and a take. It's not just a give. It's where we also receive. It was two, like, two years ago, the, the series was reminding us that in mission, that it's not doesn't fall on us, but rather it, we, we, we fall on Jesus. We, it's not that we bring Jesus to the community, it's rather we meet Jesus in the community to do ministry alongside him. Amen? That's a big difference, isn't it? Because right? I know that if I try to do the ministry alone, that it just becomes too much. It becomes all... And, if, and let's say if I do the ministry alone and, it is, and it's judged by the world as successful, well, where does that leave me? Nothing but an inflated ego. And that's the last thing you need is your pastor to have an extra inflated ego, right? Our identity as Christians is always to be grounded in the identity of Christ. You see, two years ago when I was doing this series on mission, I was trying to remind us that we meet Jesus. And that our identity as a Christian, as much as I love the United Methodist Church, is not in John Wesley, but rather in Jesus Christ. I used to have a, I've shared this a few times, but I had a professor, and uh, I had a high school teacher in English who always put at the top of his paper, who are you? And, and my answer today is, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My identity comes to my Lord and Savior. We viewed people in this last year actively engaged with Jesus. The individuals or small groups. We saw Jesus meet people in their needs. Right? We know that we don't have to elevate ourselves to be in the presence of Christ, but I think we often forget that, that we can meet Jesus where we are in our brokenness. We don't have to dress up. We don't have to do A, B, and C first, but we can just meet Jesus. That's what we've seen all throughout the lecture uh, lessons, all the gospel lessons we shared this year. Jesus feeds, we've seen that Jesus feeds us when we are hungry, both physically and spiritually. We've seen throughout the last year's lectures, uh, uh, sermons, that Jesus heals us when we are hurt, both physically and spiritually. And we've seen, very simply put, that Jesus welcomes us when we feel unworthy. Now, I mean, those are just three things that Jesus does, but I think that really sums up as so much. It sounds so simple, it sounds so easy, but it's so much. When I was preparing the slides for this message, I was thinking to myself, you know, when, when Jesus feeds us when we're hungry, both physically and spiritually, I don't think you can separate the two. It's not an and or. It's just, it goes together. When Jesus heals us physically, it's also spiritually or vice versa. You cannot separate the two. And when Jesus welcomes us, when we feel unworthy, it's, that this is a ministry, you know, this is something I wanted to take a, a minute on. I was sharing, um, I shared this at annual conference with, with those who were able to attend. Uh, I had a young lady that's um, in class with at um, URI, and she's going into some, uh, her degree is going into some type of public service. And she asked me, she says, um, Barry, what do you do as a pastor? And, and not that I haven't been asked that question before, I'm asked that question quite often at my district committee and ordained ministry meetings, but I wanted to give her a relevant answer that would that would extend from outside of being a pastor, right? But someone, anyone that, that cares for people. And I, I told her, and I'm probably not going to say it as, that eloquently, but it was, I told her this. I listen to those that don't feel they're ever listened to. I care for those who feel that they are worthy of care. And I love those 
who feel unloved. So it's listen to those who feel unlistened to, care for those who feel the unworthy of being cared for, and love those who feel unloved. And I said to her, I said, I don't think you need to be a pastor to do that. I would offer you to think about this as you go into whatever job or career you go into as a as, um, public servant, uh, public services. That's our call, I think, as Christians. That's our call as the identity of Jesus Christ. So that's what we've been up to this last year. Today, we are celebrating Christ the King Sunday. And I guess my question is, why, why do we celebrate this day? And what does this even mean? I've, I've preached on this. Um, well, I, I suppose I preach on this every year, um, one man or another. Um, just a few months ago, we did that, song, uh, that, that rap of, That's My King, if you remember that. I, I'm not doing that today. I usually play that on Christ the King. Um, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about what is Christ the King and why do we celebrate it at the end of the year? Um, um, so let's just jump into it. Um, back in um, 19, uh, 20, 1924, 25, um, there was a Pope Pius VI. He instituted Christ the King Sunday. Um, and now he did this for three basic reasons. <laughs> reasons. One is that the nation would see that the church has the right to freedom and immunity from the state. Uh, that's pretty powerful, right, to declare, um, to declare Christ the King. Um, that's threatening. We'll see that in today's scripture reading that I shared with you a moment ago. Number two, the leaders and nations would see that they are bound to give respect to Christ. So there's a hierarchy here, right, and it's Christ first, God first. And three, that the faithful would gain strength and courage from the celebration of the feast as we are reminded that Christ must reign in our hearts, in our minds, in our will, and in our bodies. There's one problem, of course, anytime we um, use the word king, and I have brought this up before, but it's important for us. What do we think of when we hear the word king? Does anybody have a strong image of when you hear king? Does it make you smile? Like if I said probably king to my grandmother, um, she would probably smile because she, she liked, she liked um, Queen Elizabeth, right? She had a picture on the wall. She looked like Queen Elizabeth, yes. I have a picture of that in a minute, but um, not a the comparison. But, or does your mind a little bit more, like, is it more like, oh, I don't like the idea of a king of being brutally ruled over? Is there an image? So I had a couple pictures here, right? Here's a Game of Thrones. Sean, do you know his name? I don't know. Uh, is he a good king or a bad king? He's honorable. Honorable. That's a good word. A good king. No, but, but there is a bad king, is there not? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, so Teresa's away in um, Ireland, um, Iceland. Bob and Linda's away. I had a reference for him today. Uh, who's his name, Sean? Uh, and he, I've watched a couple of seasons. I'm not recommending this, Lois. This is a very crude show. <laughs> so I'm not advocating for this one. Um, I just know that they're, um, he was a very bad king. Yes. Um, and here's Queen Elizabeth, which my grandmother did look very much like her. Um, this one was for Bob, or do we think of like the king of rock and roll, um, where we just did our, our song, um, One Pair of Hands. Um, the, the problem, of course, we are a, a republic, uh, you know, consider ourselves somewhat democratic and within that republic. And, you know, the idea of having a king ruling over us is, is a, little, um, a little difficult. I just had a friend from class uh, named, oh, the, the young lady I played the, the TED talk a few weeks back, um, Aria, she went to England and, and she was a little put off when she went to the palace about why the people would allow such wealth for just a small family. And, and, and to love to do that, she said, I was very perplexed. We haven't had a chance to debrief. She has more to say about it, but she, you could tell she was very concerned that so much wealth went to just one family and everyone seemed okay about it, she said. I don't know. So how do we view kings? Uh, my mind often goes to like kind of more of tyrant, of one person ruling over. Um, but that's not fair because I guess there's been good kings and bad kings. Um, but I wanted to share with you how scripture sees the king. Um, and I also want to be, have you all be mindful that in our scripture reading today that there was a king and his name was? Uh, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, Pilate, right? Pontius Pilate? Yeah, but my, my, yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry. I'm not, I mean, of king-like status. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. But I mean, like, there's this 
all-powerful, right? It's not this, that kind of idea, but you are, I hear what you're saying. I wanted to share with you some scripture reading on kings in the Bible. And, and, it, and this one's from 1 Timothy. To the king of ages, immortality, invisibly, invisible, um, they own, the only God be honor and glory forever and ever. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said, You have, you have said so. And this will be made mag magnificent as the proper time be the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Continues, now we're in Revelation. And they sing, sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and wonderful are they, thy deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and, tr just and true are thy ways, O King of the ages. And, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by, by his blood. Again in Revelation. <clears throat> On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I have just a little note here, uh, continue reading from that. But we'll see from those readings I just had that King was one of the earliest titles given to the Son of God. Notice that the title does not refer to a stature of an earthly king, right? Which many of the people were expecting. A king that would overthrow Rome's rule and be earthly king of the Israel, to Israel. Uh, the Israelites, I think I just made an error there, that's fine. Um, so, yes, as my uncle was saying, Herod was the, the king. Um, there was this trying to work out this balance between, um, between the, the customs and the faith of, of the Jewish nation and also of Roman influence. The people expected a king like, Old Testament king, like who? Yeah, David. They expected a king like David, and they were going to overthrow Rome. And the people were disappointed because Jesus didn't live up to that expectation. Um, we see that Jesus re is not taking the title of an earthly king, but rather redefining the word king for humanity. Jesus came to be our spiritual king. His kingdom is in the realm of, that is not confined to earth but is also in heaven. It's a God, it's, it's an elevation that no person could live up to. And that brings us to this morning's gospel lesson, where I'll go to the bottom, and, and, and where we have Pilate questioning Jesus. And now Jesus does something that, pictures in modern day text, if you did this, what would happen? So, so Pilate um, asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Seems kind of harmless. But what Jesus is saying, are, are you in charge or are those people that brought me in in charge? Because you wouldn't have asked this if it wasn't for them. Picture that, right? You, know? you go before someone that's making an accusation, it's like, uh, like a judge, and, you're like, and, and you were brought in for nothing. And it is a mob of people, and you say to the judge, oh, are you doing this because I really broke the law? Or are you doing this because you're following mob rule? What kind, of, what kind of person of leadership are you? It's the kind of thing that will get you crucified especially during the time when that was what Romans were really good at. Pilate replied, I am not, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. Now this is where we have to be careful with the, Jewish, um, with the word Jews. In, in John, I always have this little pause. This is not an anti-Semitic message. This was written in a community where they were fighting with a Jewish community that was fighting with a different Jewish community. They were trying to find themselves now that they were following of the Messiah. So this is not an anti-Semitic message. But rather, this is just a message of saying, like if we said, you know, those Methodists down the street are doing this. I'll continue where it says, but as it was... As it is, my kingdom is not from, um, from here. And Pilate asked him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, 
And for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. You see very strong language in the Gospel of John. We say it's a lot different than where our lectionary has been taking us in the Gospel of Mark, right? Which has been a, we see at times in the Gospel of Mark where we have the messianic secret. Where Jesus is like, don't tell anybody. Here we see Jesus like, you called it. I'm the son of God. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. For everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Jesus Christ, our King. One of the biggest differences between a kingdom, a worldly kingdom and a worldly king and the kingdom of Jesus Christ is you're not forced into it. Right? I mean, it reminds me of the old Monty Python movie, um, oh, what is it, uh, Life of Brian, when it says, um, the encounter, I think that's one where he encounters the king and he's like, I never voted for no king. You know, you don't have a say. Right? We, if you're under a kingdom, you're under that. And you're, you know, servant to that. Now, that isn't how Christ the King is. I love this picture. You see the picture where they have the, the crown of thorns versus the goldly crown? It's interesting, is it not? So why do we share this at the end of our church, of our church year? Well, first thing is, we're going to go back to the idea that if we are meeting Jesus in the mission field, if we are meeting Jesus, we are identifying with Jesus, we're reminded that we are, meet, we are going... We are being yoked, if you will. We are being united to a glorious king, a magnificent king of power and justice and righteousness. And as we follow our Lord and Savior, that we are reminded that there are no kings above us. If you think about it, it's, it's kind of sacri It's so sacrilegious when we hear, like, um, you know, the king of kings, uh, anybody else taking the name of king of kings. For there's only one king. And I ask you this year, as we come to the end of the year, and as you work on your little homework assignment of coming up with a New Year's resolution of being a child of Christ, how do you identify yourself to the kingship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Is there other kings above him? What's interesting, our lectionary, and I shared some of these with you already, but it, our lectionary closes this, this season in Revelation, where it says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the king of the earth. That should give you hope. That should give you hope that when things aren't going right, and the world is upside down and seems to be all lost. To be reminded that to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve him. To serve his God and Father. To him be the glory, the power, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And then the scripture continues a little further in this beginning section of Revelation. And I invite you to do this. To look. He is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all people on earth will mourn because of him. So shall be it. Amen. For I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. Says the Lord God. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. That's not, a God, that's not a worldly king, is it? Our identity as Christians is grounded in the identity of Christ our King. Remember that. The easiest saying is when, actually, Lois and I just had a little conversation the other day where I was remind, sharing with her that, and sometimes people take offense at this, but I tell them that I am not a Methodist but I'm rather a follower of Jesus Christ who worships in a Methodist church. What is your identity? So this brings us to where do we go for this next, next season. As we see that big things can happen in small groups, we're going to take this, we're going to see where the Holy Scripture shows us this idea of disciples. And we're going to take this idea. I don't know. I'm not going to spend any time on it today. We're going to, I just wanted to plant this with you. 
And we're basically be picking it up stronger once we're into February. We will be talking about it a little bit through the Advent season, but we're going to really start working on it in February, uh, in mid-January. Um, what does it mean to be a disciple? What, is, what, what, don't, don't answer it now, but what, what do you think of when you hear this? What does it mean to be one? What does it mean to make one? And we're going to be focusing a lot of our time and energy this year is looking at the power of mentoring. Does anyone here have a mentor? Just the one? I have a mentor, so I guess that's two. Has anyone ever been mentored? Yeah. Yeah. You? Yeah. Mentee? So we, what? That's a, that's a shame because you all have such many wonderful gifts that we can share with each other. Um, in a one-on-one -on -one covenant relationship. Um, so we're gonna explore this this year. So as I shared with you before, they say, I shared this just last week when you know, the district superintendent says that he wants us to be more focused on small groups. And we say, we already are a small group. We can see that this powerful things happen. I have some testimonies from, from some from beloved parishioners here. We're gonna be inviting them to share as we continue this year and hopefully more and more stories. But I'd like to see us form a bonded discipleship where we each take on a mentor and mentee. So, in spirit of the church, holy calendar, I wish you all a happy new year. We find ourselves coming into the Advent season where we'll be lighting the candles and the kids will be all excited watching them as they come and with those beautiful Advent calendars. But please, please, I invite you to to take on the idea of, of how you, um, what New Year resolution do you want to take in your walk relationship with, with Jesus Christ?